So what would I consider basic neural imaging to entail? An emergent non-contrast head CT is standard of care for all patients presenting with a coma. It's fast, non-invasive, and will make an unequivocal diagnosis in a significant fraction of patients. If the head CT and aforementioned lab tests are non-revealing, an MRI scan can be considered depending upon the circumstances. Specific abnormalities that may be detected by MRI but missed by CT scan include uh, brainstem or cerebellar infarcts, very early cerebral infarcts, herpes encephalitis, and anoxic encephalopathy. Abnormalities of cardiac conduction occur with both drug overdose and intracranial abnormalities. The most common EKG abnormality in this context is probably simple QT prolongation, which can occur from a great variety of drugs, among which neuroleptics are the most likely to lead to a coma in toxic doses. Here's an example of an uncommon but well-described consequence of a specific drug overdose. You can see that not only is the QT interval prolonged, but so is the QRS duration. Although the P waves are difficult to discern, if they were visible, you would likely see a prolonged PR interval. There is poor R wave progression and a Bugatta-like pattern in V1 through V3 with an elevated but downsloping ST segment coming off of the QRS. Finally, there is the nearly pathognomonic finding of a prominent and prolonged R wave in lead AVR. So what class of drug causes all of this in toxic doses? Tricyclic antidepressants. Here's another example of a non-cardiac condition that can lead to coma and often has notable EKG findings. What do you notice in this case? Very deep and symmetric T wave inversions in the anterior precordial leads, particularly in V2. What causes this? A subarachnoid hemorrhage. I have no idea why subarachnoid hemorrhages specifically cause this abnormality, but I have witnessed it multiple times and it's well described in the literature. Regarding a lumbar puncture, I would consider it mandatory in any patient who is also presenting with fever, leukocytosis, and or meningeal signs. In patients without any of those additional features, I would still consider it if the typical early workup failed to determine a diagnosis. How about an EEG? The one major etiology of coma that an EEG can diagnose is non-convulsive status epilepticus. Although it can also provide supporting evidence for a small collection of other diagnoses, such as periodic epileptiform discharges over the temporal lobes seen in herpes encephalitis. Now, non-convulsive status is one of those diagnoses that I feel internists just get more excited about than neurologists. Maybe it's my, just my home institutions, but I feel that every time I call a neurologist to request an EEG for possible non-convulsive status, I receive this telepathic groan uh, that's then followed by a polite explanation that non-convulsive status is very rare and EEGs are rarely helpful in the evaluation of coma of unknown cause. However, uh, contrary to this uh, impression that I'm given, um, I know of at least one series uh, of 236 patients who presented with coma and no overt seizure activity, in which every patient received a routine EEG as part of their coma evaluation. Non-convulsive status epilepticus was present in 8%. While 8% isn't a particularly dramatic number, it is certainly high enough to suggest the te test is worthwhile to order. At this point, I would like to transition to discussing management. I understand that I've been talking for a while, and if you are still with me at this point, I applaud your motivation. I promise we are nearing the end. Management of coma is largely directed at the underlying cause, which I will not get into any more at this point, because uh, obviously that, that discussion is very lengthy. Um, however, there are several very general principles that apply to a large subset of patients. First, is there a history of trauma 
or was the patient found down under unclear circumstances? If so, the cervical spine should be immobilized immediately and formally cleared by radiographs. Next, is the airway safety compromised or is there severe respiratory acidosis? If so, the patient should be emergently intubated. Is the patient's Glasgow coma score less than or equal to eight? If so, many authorities would consider intubation irrespective of respiratory status. Now, unless the diagnosis is known immediately upon presentation, all patients should receive 100 milligrams of intravenous thymine, one amp of D50 if for some reason the glucose cannot be readily assessed via glucometer, and 0.2 to 0.4 milligrams of IV naloxone, which is the reversal agent for opiate toxicity. It's important to keep in mind that naloxone can also improve coma even in the absence of opiate toxicity. So I wouldn't use it too strongly as a diagnostic tool, but rather as presumptive treatment. One question that frequently comes up at this point is whether the comatose patient should receive flumazenil. Flumazenil can reverse sedation and respiratory depression due to benzodiazepine overdose. The dosing is 0.2 milligrams given IV over 30 seconds and it can re be repeated at intervals of one to two minutes. The onset of action is under three minutes and its duration is about one hour. Unfortunately, due to its potential risks such as seizures, arrhythmias, and vomiting with subsequent aspiration, some sources advise against routine administration. These side effects, particularly seizures, are thought to most likely occur in patients on chronic benzodiazepines. A meta-analysis provided an answer to this question in 2007. It examined seven trials involving 466 patients with coma and suspected drug overdose in which the patients were randomized to either flumazenil or placebo. So what did it find? Those patients receiving flumazenil were more likely than placebo to wake up from their coma in response to drug administration. In the three trials that reported specific Glasgow coma scores, the flumazenil group had an average improvement of 1.1 points at 5 to 15 minutes. Regarding the safety of cross-the-board flumazenil administration, among the 242 patients randomized to flumazenil, there was only one serious adverse event, which was a non-fatal tonic-clonic seizure. So one seizure in 242 patients with a significant increased chance of reversing the coma. My conclusion would be that the risk-benefit profile strongly favors administration of flumazenil, although I still would hold out with, for the possible exception of those patients with a known history of seizure disorder. So that pretty much does it for coma. Uh, I'd like to summarize the lecture, but it was uh, fairly dense with information. So instead of a true summary, I'll provide a handful of bullet take-home points. First, a coma requires dysfunction of either the brainstem or both cerebral hemispheres. Coma should be distinguished from similar appearing conditions. Full evaluation and initial management should be considered emergent and should occur simultaneously. An EEG should be considered for diagnosis of non-convulsive status epilepticus and the etiology remains unclear after basic investigation. Intubation should be strongly considered in any patient with an inability to protect the airway, with a respiratory acidosis, or with a Glasgow coma score of less than or equal to 8. Unless the etiology is obvious, patients should receive thymine, glucose, and naloxone. And last, flumazenil should be also strongly considered in drug intoxication as possible as its risk of serious adverse effects is relatively low. I hope you have found this lecture on coma both informative and useful. Once again, this has been Eric Strong of the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital and Stanford University.